It's difficult when we use words like faith and reason in the same sentence. Because we're children of an age in which we believe that faith is defined by that which goes beyond reason. We're tempted to think of faith as something that absolutely transcends the boundaries of reason, giving us opportunity to hold to something as true which we, which we cannot reach to logically, which we cannot understand rationally, and which we, we cannot see or touch. And that definition has a certain kind of truth to it. We've accepted it very much as part of our, our experience in the modern age. But it doesn't leave us with much if we refuse to seek a reasonable faith. And I think we're living in an age, particularly in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, where this issue is going to become increasingly important. And so I'm going to take the risk of speaking directly to you about these things over the next couple of weeks. Today will just be a simple introduction to the idea. A reasonable faith. Faith and reason. Depending on your denominational background, theology is based on a three-legged stool or a four-legged stool or maybe even a two-legged or one-legged stool. It really depends on how you see the way in which various things are going to function in authority in your church. Now, before I lose you all to sheer boredom, I do have a point with this. Let me pull it together for you. We accept as a basis of our faith what? Jesus, of course, but how do we learn about Jesus? Scripture. We take Scripture as a basis for our faith. Scripture is what? Tell me more about Scripture. It's God's Word. It's useful for instruction and teaching. It's inspired. It's good news. It builds our relationship with God. Been around a long time. Now, what if I were to tell you that same, those, some of those same things, with the exception of Jesus, might apply to scriptures of other tradition? What do we mean when we speak of scripture in the Christian context? The Hebrew Bible or Old Testament, the Torah, the Law and the Prophets, and we're speaking of the Gospels and the Epistles and letters, yes? The New Testament and Old combined. Okay. So the Bible becomes a basis for learning and authority within our tradition. The Protestant sort of cry was sola scriptura. Does any of you know what that means? It's Latin for, yes, in the back. Scripture only. Now that is a wonderful ideal, a wonderful ideal, but is there anything potentially problematic with that? Interpretation of the scripture, translation of the scripture. You see, in the very first place, the Bible as we know it did not fall out of the sky in English in the NIV version. Did you know that? There wasn't a prophet among us who one day woke up and received this book. You see, the Bible itself teaches this, that men of old wrote as they were inspired of the Holy Spirit. We have some 66 books making up our sacred text, written over a period of thousands of years by diverse individuals from various parts of the world. This makes up our scripture. And so the very idea of saying that we can depend on Scripture alone, well, what do we mean by that? Are we talking about the Hebrew Scripture? How facile are all of us with Akkadian, Hittite, Babylonian, etc.? I know none of those things. Cuneiform, I can't read it. All of these things that make up words that go and supplement the Hebrew lexicon of the Old Testament and further add to our basis of understanding and knowledge. And then you get to the New Testament, and we're talking about Koine Greek, but there are references to 
Toric Ionic, classical Greek as well, go back even to the earliest times. How are we to understand these things? How are we to translate them into a language that we speak and make sense within our culture and make this ancient text alive and useful to us today? We can't really just access Scripture directly. We need it translated, and then if we're going to live in a community of faith together under some sort of understanding of what it means, we not only need it translated for us in some kind of way, but we need to come to a common consensus on what we think its key and most important teachings are. Yes? Have I lost you? Good. Oh, I'm glad. I'll try to try to get through this. I don't want to put you into a coma. Um, we don't need to test, uh, test you on that. What I'm trying to get at is the ideal of Scripture alone is a wonderful ideal, and yet, in fact, we need a translated Scripture, and at some level, we need an interpreted Scripture, even if we participate in that interpretation ourselves, which Protestants would want to do very important to us. This is why I'm constantly saying, why your teachers were constantly saying, why your parents were constantly saying, read your Bible. It's vital that you read it, know it, and interpret it for yourself, that you bring your intellect and mind to the reading of Scripture. But now we get to other legs of a potential stool, don't we? You see, if it requires interpretation, by what means will you interpret it? Does that require a certain kind of intelligence? Would we all agree that translation and interpretation would require a certain type of intelligence? Yes? Absolutely. So now we're applying human thinking or reason as we look at study, translate, and interpret. So one leg of our stool, if you will, that we sit on, our theological stool that we climb on or stand on, one leg of it is going to be the Bible. It's going to be Scripture as we call it and understand it. It's going to speak to us in a way that has authority that no other set of writings does for us. Agreed? That's part of our Protestant heritage. For us, the Bible will have an authority that transcends the authority of other texts. But now that might be problematic. Can we think of ways in which that might be problematic? Any ideas? Anything the scripture teaches that if we took it directly, without filter, by authority, and applied it in today's world might be problematic? Can you think of anything? Stoning adulterers. Stoning adulterers. How do you think the United States legal system would relate to us if one of you were to be discovered in adultery and we as a congregation were to take you out to the back 40 here and stone you to death? How do you think the media in the United States would relate to us if we were to do that? Okay. And yet by the authority of Scripture, we're acting, yes? We have to apply reason. We have to use our heads. I think if we look at contemporary criticisms of Scripture and Christianity, if we look at contemporary criticisms of faith, if we listen to the atheists, if we listen to the agnostics, if we listen to the critics of religion around us, so many times badly done, by the way, and with very poor scholarship, they criticize us on the basis of text. How can God be a loving God if this X, Y, Z is there? How can you possibly maintain a faith when women are treated this way in this section of the Bible? You see? You quickly start to think through that and you know, hey, something's wrong with this picture. I read that, but I don't get the same thing out of that. I don't hear God telling me to treat women in that particular way. Or I don't think that it's acceptable to have, you know, eight wives and a thousand concubines. I'm not saying it wouldn't be interesting. <laughs> I'm not, but, it, but it's not okay. Okay, that was a joke. I, whatever. <laughs> I think laughter is one of the other stools of our theological, if we, need, if we can get it there. Okay. All right. So, um, 
I love my wife. I do. If any of you had any doubts, she is a... Honey, would you just wave? You are the light of my life. Wonderful person here. All right, so... <laughs> scripture gives us... You know, you read through some of these stories, and it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty unrelatable. That's the best term I can come up with right now. We look at some of these things and we think, really, this is what God was telling the people to do? We have to use reason. We have to become educated. We have to know something about who the speaker is, who the intended audience is, at what time in history was this taking place, what were the circumstances of both the speaker and the person receiving the message. You see, take a conversation that you have with an ordinary individual in your, in your life and exert one sentence and put that on the internet and see how people interpret it. You see? You could be instantly portrayed, all of us, as one of, one of the foulest gits in the world. You could instantly be portrayed as one of the most clueless people in the world just from a sentence that was taken that you said or was taken out of context. Maybe even a whole paragraph or a story that you related or something you laughed at. You could be characterized and mischaracterized immediately. Context is important, right? It's important. It frames and gives context. It gives shape to what we say in meaning. Helps us derive a correct interpretation of what that's all about. It requires your thinking and your reasoning. Now, see, we get into trouble here a little bit. It gets complicated, and there are people of faith who don't like what I am just saying to you now. But if reason is applied, then couldn't we get into trouble, they would want to say. Isn't reason limited? Isn't our reason sometimes faulty? Aren't we self-deceived in our reasoning? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I am good at justifying about anything I want to justify. And you are too. We're very good at self-deception. And we can find a reasonable basis for living in lies just as we can find a reasonable basis for living in faith. But that doesn't excuse us from the task of asking the hard questions and looking at our text and our faith in a way that ultimately vindicates God and builds faith, not destroys it. You see, the theological enterprise, the enterprise of knowing God in Scripture is not the lazy man or woman's enterprise. It requires a little bit of diligence, just a bit of diligence, a bit of perseverance, a bit of effort, a bit of elbow grease, if you will. It requires us to think past our culture and our presuppositions. It requires us to be open to change and thought and to grow. It requires us to analyze. It requires of us a great deal. Now, another potential problem here is that we all come to reason itself and the Scripture with a particular lens. It's like glasses. Okay, My prescription will not work for very many of you. Some of you, thank God, don't need glasses at all. That was me until 42 years of age. And then something happened, and I was reading menus like this, and my wife said, "Hun, you might need glasses. It hadn't even occurred to me. All right? When I take this off, I can still tell who you are as people probably... Almost all of you I can still see clearly enough to name by name without glasses, but life is a lot clearer with these things on. A lot clearer. When we come to the Scriptures, we come with a particular lens. That lens might be culture. Let me give you an example. You might come from a culture that's very patriarchal, male-dominated. You will read Scripture differently than someone who comes from a matriarchal or more egalitarian culture. You'll read it differently. 
You may from, come from a culture where spirits are very much alive. You've seen somebody possessed of an evil spirit in your country. You have heard people speak of spirits in the woods or the places, and you are sensitive to the fact that evil and good lurk all around you. You will read the scripture differently than a Western person who really wants to deny anything exists but what we can see, touch, feel, and taste. You will read the scripture differently. These are lenses, lenses of culture and language and thought. And the good news I have for you today is as threatening as that might be, as challenging as that might be to us to read Scripture together and come to some sort of consensus or conclusion together, what it tells me is that the Scripture is big enough to transform all of our lives and cultures. You may come to it with a certain lens, but the God of Jesus Christ, through the Comforter, the Spirit He sends, will speak to you whatever your culture is, whatever your grade level of learning is, whatever your context or culture is, whatever your background, whatever your experience, the God of Scripture will speak to you and teach you and bring you to what you need to know. Do you believe that? Does that mean that we're all going to be in the same place at the same time? No. So this enterprise of living together in diversity in church with a common scripture and reason that we would want to say is basically the same for all of us, a kind of rationality, may yet still yield diverse conclusions. There's a third stool. This one the Adventist church struggles with the most, although it's very strong, even in our company. It's called tradition. You see, for Catholics, and some of you come out of this tradition, church tradition itself has the same authority as Scripture. This is highly problematic for Protestants. Because if you develop a tradition, for example, that says, when the, sp when the Pope speaks on his throne in Rome, speaks ex cathedra. The words that he speak, the papal bulls that he issues, have the same authority of Scripture as Scripture. They're inspired at the same level as all the prophets and all the writers of the New Testament. Protestants go, hey, wait a minute. I don't think so. We're not ready for that. Okay. That third thing of tradition can be problematic depending on how we view it. If we see tradition, that is to say the traditions that we've developed ecclesiastically in our church, in our circles, as having the same authority as Scripture, we may have gone too far. But do Seventh-day Adventists have a tradition? You have to think about that. Do we have traditions around food? Yes. Do we have traditions around Sabbath? Yes. Do we have traditions around education, health ministry, evangelism? If we don't have traditions, we have conventions around these things, proscriptions and prohibitions around these things. We have a culture. In fact, I would classify Seventh-day Adventists as sectarian and as having a particular subculture within the larger Christian and Western culture. That's why it's very difficult to leave, even if you want to. And it's difficult to get in, even if you want to. We want to break down the barriers, and yet there are a lot of specific things, language that we use, that's Adventist jargon. My wife reminds me that I use too much of it from right here. So if I give you an abbreviation, like at the GC, and you come to me after church and say, what is GC? I will apologize and say, I'm sorry. What I meant to tell you was that I was referring to the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists located in Silver Spring, Maryland. My apologies. In my Adventese 
I just said GC. Or PUC, there's a confusing one. Am I referring to Pacific Union Conference of Seventh-day Adventists, or am I referring to Pacific Union College? Who knows? You have to have the context. So the third thing is authority. Are you with me? No, first is, I'm sorry, authority, scripture. Second is reason. Third is tradition. That's what I meant to say. Tradition comes together with that. The fourth leg is experience. This one's very dangerous. And I would say a lot of Protestants, and I don't think Adventists rely much on this, but I'm going to throw it out there because there are traditions that embrace this. What is your walk with God? What is your story? If we were to take time to storyboard your life today, if we were to take time to, to just put it all out there and storyboard your life, what would be the markers where you would say, God was with me in this, or God spoke to me in this, or my experience of God during this period of time was very difficult? He didn't feel present to me at all. But then I had this happen, and God, God presented himself once again. If we were to storyboard your life, what is your experience? What experience do you bring in terms of your understanding of God? That would be the fourth leg. What I want us to explore together the next few weeks is what does a reasonable faith look like? Because what we're in danger of at times, and, and this is happening corporately to some degree, and I'll, I'll get into specifics later, we're in danger of narrowing and constricting ourselves in our patterns of looking at authority and faith and doctrine to the point that it's not only difficult for anybody else to access, access, but it becomes a dissonance for ourselves and our children. We must never allow this to happen. It's not my responsibility alone, it is your responsibility. We must never allow that to happen. Our faith must always be big enough and broad enough to contain not only the revelations of God past, but the revelation of God present. We are not, I'll get into this later too. I'm running out of time, so I'll get into this later. We are not a creedal church. We have not formulated our beliefs and opinions in such a way that we believe they are carved in stone, absolutely perfect and correct in the form in which we've articulated them, and never ever to be revisited or changed. And the reason for this is simple and clear. God is spirit, and we must move with him. John chapter 3, is it, or 4? Four? 4 probably. The Spirit is like a wind. It blows. We can see its effects. We know what the effect is, but we don't see the wind, where it's coming from or where it's going. That is the journey of faith. Now, I'm going to ask you to sit tight for a few more minutes because I want to take today's Scripture and bring it into what I just shared with you. Do we have time for that or do we need to go? Don't worry, the burger roast isn't going to burn. It'll be there for you in just a few minutes. All right. So we just read this fantastic passage in Acts, and I would invite you to go home and read Acts 26 for yourself. But if you will get out your pew Bible, page 1031, or your own Bible, and turn to Acts 26, we can certainly get through a few, few pieces of this and contextualize it in what I've shared with you today. Paul has been arrested. He was about to be flogged, and he reminded those who were going to flog him that he was a Roman citizen. And a Roman citizen could not be flogged or disciplined without a trial, without being proven to be guilty. And so Paul has uh, uh, reminded them of this, and through the course of time when it became clear that the authorities in Jerusalem might act against his rights, he appealed to Caesar and is in the process of being heard by all the lesser courts before he gets to 
Caesar, and he appears before Agrippa, a king, the last of the the Herods, if you will. And uh, he says this, verse 2, I consider myself fortunate to stand before you and make my defense as you are well acquainted with all Jewish customs and controversies. You see, within Judaism, even though they had the same Torah, the same five books of the Old Testament, the same authority, the same Psalms, the same Proverbs, the same other books that aren't in our Bible, those kinds of things, even though they had all those things, there was controversy and disagreement. Reasonable people read those things and had different points of view. And the Sadducees did not believe in resurrection life. They did not believe in the resurrection of the dead, and the Pharisees did. Jesus, by the way, would have been a Pharisee, as was Paul. They both taught and believed in the resurrection of the dead. And this is really critical for Paul and, and, and for all of us, actually. So he, he reminds them through his little resume here and through his, his uh, speech that he has conformed to the strictest sect of the religion living as a Pharisee, verse 5, and that it is because of his hope in God and what God has promised his ancestors and all of their ancestors that he was on trial that day. So he frames his own arrest in the setting of controversy. It is because of this hope, verse 7, that these Jews are accusing me. The hope fulfilled, that is to say, the coming of the Messiah. He says, it is because of this hope that the Jews are accusing me. Why should you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? There's the question. Why is this incredible? And so what has been deemed blasphemy or a troublemaking, he frames clearly in the theological controversy of the time. Is there a resurrection or isn't there? And you see, if there was a resurrection, then the Sadducees might be forced to look differently at Jesus and his story. They might be forced to think differently about what it is that God wanted to accomplish among his people. Paul relates his story of persecuting the Jews who believed, the followers of the way. He tells them of the Damascus experience when he saw a light from heaven brighter than the sun blazing around him and his companions, so much so that they all fell on their faces and fell to the ground. He heard a voice, and he responded, Who are you, Lord? And the voice said, Post-crucifixion, post-resurrection, I am Jesus, unequivocally, whom you're persecuting. Now get up. Stand on your feet. You see, I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and witness of what you have seen of and will see of me now and into the future. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So Paul is relating this to Agrippa. He's been given in this encounter of a resurrected Christ a new mission which is expansive. He preached that all should repent and turn to God and demonstrate repentance by their deeds. And the circle starts getting bigger from Jews to those in Damascus to the Gentiles and all those further afield. He's making sense. He's speaking a language that the authorities can understand. And one of them gets angry. Festus interrupts and says, you're out of your mind. It says he shouted it. Your great learning is driving you insane. Your impressive logic, your way with words, you're, you're going mad, Paul. And Paul, polite as ever, says, I am not insane, most excellent, Festus. What I am saying is what? True and reasonable. It was true to his experience and the experience of those around him. It was true to the experience and testimony of the apostles who saw Jesus and the witnesses who saw Jesus post-resurrection. 
It was true to the story of salvation as Paul read it and reasoned it through the Old Testament or the Hebrew Scriptures. It was true and it was reasonable. The king is familiar with these things, and I can speak freely to him. I am convinced that none of this has escaped his notice because it was not done in a corner. It was not a secret thing. It was not hidden away. King Agrippa, do you believe in the prophets? For I know that you do. King Agrippa, very perceptive, very savvy, doesn't fall for this, doesn't say, oh, yes, I believe in the prophets, because what would a reasonable person have done if they really believed in the prophets? They would believe in the word of the prophets and the prophecies that were fulfilled by whom? Jesus. He would have to accept the testimony of Paul that he had seen Jesus on the Damascus Road and that he was risen from the dead. That's powerful. Agrippa cuts to the chase and says, do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? Paul replied, short time or long, I pray to God that not only you, but all who are listening may become what I am, a follower of Jesus and the way. They left the room saying this man is innocent and does not deserve death. If he hadn't appealed to Caesar, we could set him free. Paul gives in our own scriptures a reasoned account of his faith. And I wonder if we can do the same. I wonder if we were bearing testimony as he would that we could bring the three things that he brings into his argument into an argument or into a sharing time with anybody that we met, would we be able to bring, bring in the authority and the word of the prophets, that is to say the authority of the scripture that's come before? Would we be able to speak in a reasonable fashion, laying out the story of salvation as we had experienced it? And finally, would we be able to speak to our own experience of a risen Savior and Lord. Would we? These are the things that go into making a reasonable faith and defense of faith. I'm going to ask that you go home and read the Old Testament passage and think about the expansion of the gospel that takes place between Isaiah's words and Paul's words. Between what Isaiah writes and what Paul writes. Between the audience of those that were acceptable to God as Isaiah sees it, and the audience of those who are acceptable to God as Paul sees it. You'll see a dramatic expansion. You see, in Isaiah, this is what it says, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. But this is not the reason of an adult. This is not the reasoning of an educated person or the reason of an analytical person. This is the reason of somebody who can see the difference between living under punishment and living under blessing. This is coercive reason. If you do what I tell you, life is going to go good for you. <coughs> Excuse me. If you don't do what I tell you, life is going to be very hard. Come now, let us reason. I think you can figure out which path to take. Do you see the difference between the reason of Isaiah and the reason of Paul? No? Yeah, you do. Come, let us reason together. Let us set our sights on Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith. Let us stand as a body that can speak to authority, with reason, from experience, unafraid to embrace the good of the tradition that we experience while being critical of that tradition for ways in which it hampers the truth of a risen Savior speaking, singing, kissing life into a fallen world. God bless you this day.